here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you Okay, today we're going to um, carry on uh, and continue looking at this idea and this understanding around this theme of faith. Um, and we'll be looking at the, the very end of the chapter 11 of Hebrews. Uh, so we're kind of picking up where we left off uh, last week. Um, so if you've got your Bibles or your phones, that's where we'll be. And we'll be in Hebrews 11 again um, for most of this talk. As we saw and thought about um, last time, I found that um, a way of looking at and a way of thinking about this idea around faith uh, that can be really helpful is to define the word as persuasion. That it's not that I stand here in, in front of a camera uh, and talk to you in a beautiful YouTube land and, and somehow persuade you with the words that I'm speaking and with how emphatic I am gesticulating towards you. Uh, it's not even 
um, that you can persuade yourself. See, if it was about me persuading you, then just as uh, likely would be that you could then watch another YouTube video where someone would unpersuade you of something that I've just talked to you about. Now, it's not that you can persuade yourself because then in theory you would be saving yourself. But instead this persuasion has to come from God. It's divine persuasion. Faith is God persuading us about God. The book of Hebrews is actually a letter written to Hebrews. And it's written to these first century Jews who have uh, put their faith in Jesus. They believe that Jesus is God. And they trust that following Jesus is the only way to truly live. But, and this is, this is the big but here, but they are being persecuted. They're being persecuted because of that persuasion. And so the writer of Hebrews sends this letter to basically say to them, don't give up. To plead with them, don't go back. To emphatically um, tell them that you can do this. And that can be a message for us, uh, particularly in the time that we find ourselves in right now. Hearing those words spoken to us, don't give up. Don't go back. You can do this. And then as we get further through the letter to Hebrews and into chapter 11, this writer does something brilliant. She goes right way, way back to the beginning and highlights how all of these Jewish superstars had received this same divine persuasion that these Hebrews had now received. And how they had lived their lives out of this desire to see and to know and to follow Jesus, even before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. So let's read some. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 32. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, and shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength in weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Wow. That's a very descriptive few verses there, a very passionate and descriptive list. But for us today, this bit of the Bible in particular is probably one of the most unrelatable. We read things like sawn in two, fed to lions, tortured. I don't think any of us have had to face that kind of stuff, have we? Now, I don't know about you, but when I read things like this, I really struggle to relate it to me and to my life here and now. I'm not just talking about the details of what those people went through, but also the sheer resilience of the faith that they, uh, they exemplify through their lives. Because faced with even a tiny, tiny fraction of that kind of persecution, how would we respond? When we read things like we've just heard there, the question always is, what would I do in that situation? How would I respond and how would I react? You see, 
for me personally, I'd like to be able to say that I'd do exactly the same as they did. I would remain strong and faithful to the end. But would we? When I read about these kinds of people, it makes me think that I'm not as good as them. That they're better than me when it comes to this faith thing. Because, honestly, I stub my little toe and I'm like, why? Why, God? So when I read bits of the Bible like this, and I, I hear about these kinds of stories, I think, is that level of faith in me? Okay. Uh, I want us to just very briefly go to another of the New Testament letters. It's only a, a little, little letter. I'm just going to read one verse from this little, little letter. But I think it really helps to get to the heart of what's going on here. See, if you, like me, ever read something in your Bible and it gets you to that point of thinking, they're so much better than me. Or in general, in life, if you, if you meet people or talk to people and you think, how are you so good? And why are you so kind? I mean, just take somebody like um, Desmond Tutu, for example. That man, the, the life that he went through, just Google him and find out some of the things that he's had to endure through his life. The things that he's been through. So much racism and persecution and hatred. But if you ever see him smile, if you ever hear his laugh, it's infectious. And so people like that must just be different than us, haven't they? Just different than the rest of us. That people like that must just be wired differently than me. So here's that one verse from that little New Testament letter. Uh, the letter is Jude, and uh, we're going to just read uh, from verse 3, chapter 1. Of Jude. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. It's just that little bit in the middle there, to contend for the faith. Now, I think that even though we can talk about it and even though we can read books about it, I don't think we really know what the faith is. You see, the whole reason that Jude wrote this little letter in the first place is because Jude had heard rumours. Jude had got word back to them about how there were people within the church that had begun to, to teach this totally wrong message about Jesus, this dangerous and wrong message. And also there were others, with, again, within the church, that were like, oh, okay, so we have Jesus and we have forgiveness for our sins, so that just means we can do what we want. We just live our lives and do whatever we want, and as long as we remember at the end of each day to say sorry, to ask for forgiveness, then that's fine, slate wiped clean. Now, these people were claiming the name and the title of Christian, but their lives didn't look any different to anybody else's. Ouch. That cuts, doesn't it? That hurts. See, that's a word for us today. How are we claiming the name and the title of Christian? Only to have our lives look exactly the same as everyone else. And so Jude writes this little letter and says, I need you to contend for, not a faith, I need you to contend for the faith. And so I think that because a lot of the time we don't know what the faith is, we just settle for something less. Because we don't know what the faith is, we settle for a faith. And again, I often wonder why. As a follower of Jesus, why do I still have these selfish desires within me? Why haven't they gotten weaker over time? Or gone away completely? 
or being replaced with something else, something good? Am I the only one to feel like this? You see, why when I'm driving, does somebody else in another car doing something get me so worked up in my car? Or why do I feel this kind of boiling prophetic injustice as I'm stood in a queue in Aldi and I see that the queue next to mine is moving quicker than my queue? You see, this example in Jude seems pretty extreme if you go into the details about what it's being written and why it's being written. With all these ideas of false teachers and false followers. But I'd argue that because we don't under actually understand the faith, we can end up in this similar position. If we're not careful, we can end up in the same position that this person, Jude, here is writing to these people about. Where our faith becomes more about being a label than it is about being a leading. Where the term Christian or us considering ourselves being Jesus followers is just a title that we give to ourselves rather than something that affects the way that we talk and walk and live and move and have our being in our everyday lives. It becomes more of a label than a leading. That's where so many of us fall down. That's where compromise and comparison can sneak in. That's where we end up looking exactly the same as everybody else. See this list in Hebrews 11, all of that persecution and torture, the lions and the giants and the beatings, those people didn't endure all of that just simply because of an idea, just because a thought had fallen into the top of their heads. Because you don't believe so strongly in a concept that you're willing to be sawn in two, do you? No, this is about something else. This is about something more. This is about the faith. Now, as we've seen already, faith in the New Testament is quite helpfully described and defined as persuasion. And so Jude says that I want you to contend for the divine persuasion. So what is the divine persuasion? What is the faith? You see, the faith isn't self-help. It isn't mind over matter. The faith isn't ideas or concepts. The faith isn't labels. The faith is an encounter with the living God who persuades you in a way that only God can. This is the faith that will change you from the inside out. This is the faith that makes you more and more like Jesus. And so I've got just three ways uh, that God persuades us. Three ways that God persuaded those original people in Hebrews 11 was talked about, three ways that God persuaded the original audience to the letter to the Hebrews, and three ways that still today God persuades you. Firstly, God gives us an event. And then secondly, God has come as a person. And then thirdly, God has continued to lead. God has given us an event. God has come as a person. God has continued to lead. And all of the trouble, all of the problems that arise, all of the stuff that, that falls apart around us as we just kind of stand in our lives and think, what, why is this happening? All of that, a lot of the time comes because we try to substitute one of those three things for something else. We try and switch out the event or swap the person or substitute this idea of leadership. And when we swap out one of those things, that's when we lose the faith and just settle for a faith. So instead of an event, we try to make it about an idea. But Christianity is actually about an actual event. When the creator of it all sacrificed himself for us. I'm here talking and you're here listening not because of an idea, but because of an, of an event. Something that happened. This isn't just about good advice, this is about good news. It's not an idea, 
it's an event. See, the first disciples and those first followers saw what happened to Jesus. They saw his life. They saw his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. They saw it all. And then they went and they shared that news. They passed on that event. And that's how we are all here today. Secondly, another thing that happens if we're not careful is the person gets substituted for a principle. But the faith isn't a collection of principles that we kind of huddle around to make us feel more successful or better than other people. No, the faith is focused on a person, Jesus the Christ. John 1.16 says that all, we all receive from Jesus' fullness grace upon grace upon grace. And grace isn't a principle. Grace is a person. Grace has a face. And it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. The problem comes when we make it about a principle. That's when our faith can be compromised. Because you can abuse a principle, can't you? You can abuse a principle much easier than you can abuse a person. If we're not careful, we end up making grace and forgiveness like a credit card. Like those original um, uh, recipients of that letter uh, from Jude. We make forgiveness like a credit card. That you just do what you want and you just kind of put it on the card and then you know that Jesus, because he forgives us, because he loves us, because of his sacrifice, Jesus has paid that debt and it's wiped clean, ready for the next day when we can start loading the card back up again. We end up making grace and forgiveness like a credit card. You see, following principles will make me feel better about being me. That's what principles will do. They'll make me feel better about being me by usually feeling less about other people, putting them down to raise myself up. But following Jesus will make me see more and more how much more I need him. The third substitution that we make is instead of seeing God as continually leading us, we act more like God is leaving us here, stranded and alone, just to get on with it by ourselves. In the gospel, Jesus calls his first disciples. It's usually translated as, as the call, as the invitation, as the challenge that he puts out to them as follow me. But I love the slight variation that um, Eugene Peterson gives in his message uh, version. And he says this, come with me. It's only slight, it's only subtle, it's only a little slight change. But that's what leading is about, isn't it? that we come with him, that we go with Jesus. See, a lot of the time, if we're not careful, we can act like, yes, Jesus gave us the Great Commission, and yes, Jesus ascended to heaven, but then we miss the next part of the story. We miss the part waiting in the upper room at Pentecost. We miss the part of the, the coming and the gifting and the empowerment of Holy Spirit. We can end up like acting like God has left. That Jesus has just left us all alone to, to get by as best as we can. When the truth is we're still being led today. So are we going to be people who respond to this, this call and this challenge to come with me from Jesus? Or have we reduced him down to an idea and a set of principles that we've just been left to get on with. With all that's going on in the world right now, with all of that's going on in our lives right now, life will still happen. Life goes on, life continues. But the question is, do we know the faith? Have we been persuaded by the actual event? Have we been persuaded by the person? Have we been persuaded by the leading? Because I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to be persecuted 
or fed to lions or sawn in to. I am not willing to be killed for an idea or a principle. That's not going to persuade me. It's not going to work. It's not going to last. I need God to persuade me. And I need God to persuade me again and again and again. So do you need persuading again today? Just ask God. It's God who does the persuading. See, I think that after all this talking and thinking about faith, we need to come back to that original call from Jesus. Come with me. So friends, may you be persuaded again. May you answer the invitation from Jesus to faithfully come with me. Amen.